of Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. He will be moderating this meeting. Yes, you have the floor. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, buenos dias. <laughs> uh, gracias. I'm, I'm afraid that's the maximum extent of my Spanish. Um, but thank you very much for uh, being here today and thank you for having me um, uh, moderating this uh, uh, panel on uh, illegal uh, governance. I will uh, uh, extend my thanks to uh, UNODC and UNODC Mexico for uh, organizing and uh, for the uh, excellent technical uh, support throughout the organization and to the, um, to the interpreters uh, that uh, will uh, um, uh, help us to reach uh, such a wider uh, audience. Also, my gratitude goes to my uh, fellow panelists. Um, you will have uh, in the chat and on the website uh, a, a description of their, uh, their, their bio, but just to uh, say a few words, um, we have uh, four panelists from uh, almost all over the world. We, we covered uh, Europe, um, uh, Central America and Latin America. Uh, we will start with Professor Federico Varese, uh, Professor of Criminology, uh, at the Department of Sociology at the University of Oxford. Uh, this will be followed by um, Salome Flores from uh, UNODC uh, in, uh, in Mexico uh, City, uh, followed by Johan uh, Skinner uh, from uh, the um, Swedish National Council for Crime Prevention in uh, uh, Sweden. And uh, finally, we'll, we'll, we'll close with Medellin uh, with uh, um, Professor Santiago Tobon from the University EAFIT uh, in, uh, in Medellin, uh, Colombia. Now, before I leave the floor uh, to the panelists, uh, just uh, uh, let me say uh, just a, a few words about the panel and the idea behind this panel and the way it's organized. Um, as you will see from the presentations, the idea behind this panel is to give you an insight about uh, criminal slash illegal governance. And uh, it will be clear that illegal governance uh, is a local phenomenon, but also global phenomenon. Global in a sense that um, can manifest itself uh, in uh, different countries across the world, uh, not just the usual uh, suspects, if you like, um, Colombia or Southern Italy, or, uh, or uh, Russia. So it's a phenomenon that can manifest itself, uh, uh, of course, to different levels um, in different parts of the world and uh, can cause uh, serious consequences uh, for uh, legitimate economy and governance and, and legitimate government, what we might term, uh, in a sense, uh, systemic harm, not just individual harm, but uh, systemic harm. We'll cover, as I said, the different uh, uh, parts uh, uh, in the world. And also we have a nicely balanced uh, uh, panel, uh, gender-wise. So 50% uh, male, 50% female. So this is excellent. And without further ado, I give the floor to the first speaker, uh, Federico Varese from the University of Oxford. Yeah, thank you very much, Paolo. I will, I will not try to speak Spanish. <laughs> I'll just try to, to share my screen. Hopefully, uh, that would be uh, the best uh, I can do. Hopefully, you can see uh, this is my uh, presentation. And uh, this goes somewhat. Um, does it go? Uh, maybe I should make it. Uh, um, sorry, just a second. I should make it um, large as I start. Right. Oh,
Right, can you see something? Uh, yes, uh, we can. Uh, not the presentation uh, uh, mode, but... Uh, yes, I suppose we have to do with... Good enough, but good enough. You can zoom nothing. in a little bit. Uh, so... Sorry? If you zoom from 110%, uh, you can zoom... Ah, yes. uh, exactly. Excellent. Okay, thank you about this. Sorry about this. Um, so, yes, what I want to talk about is um, something that I've been uh, thinking for a while. In fact, I should say that um, Paolo Campana has been uh, my co-author in some of this work. And um, what we have been thinking about together is the concept of, uh, of organized crime. Uh, now, the concept of organized crime is um, quite um, vague, as you uh, can appreciate, hopefully, from this uh, slide. Uh, this is a standard definition of organized crime. This is taken from the UK National Crime Agency. Uh, organized crime can be defined as serious crime, planned, coordinated, conducted by people working together on a continuing basis. Their motivation is often, but not always, financial. They work together for a particular criminal activity or activities. Uh, and this is an organized crime group. Now you can appreciate uh, that this is a very vague, very broad definition of uh, organized crime. In fact, it probably covers most of what we normally call crime. And it's really hard for scholars to pinpoint um, the exact activities of, uh, of, of organized crime groups, let alone uh, various aspects of organized crime, one of which is uh, governance. So, to make a long uh, story short, there's been a lot of um, uneasiness in the field of criminology over the concept of organized crime. This is a very short quote from a scholar from the 1970s uh, called Smith. Organized crime is a concept so overburdened with stereotyped imagery that it cannot meet the basic requirements of a definition. It does not include all the phenomena that are relevant and it does not exclude all the phenomena that are not relevant. So a view has been forming in, the, in my field that the concept of organized crime is bankrupt ultimately. So you can just throw it away. And many, many people in my field have decided not to use it anymore. So the, the, the line that myself and, and, and also Campana have decided to take is instead, instead to produce um, a more analytical framework that tries to cover uh, uh, organized crime in three main constituent parts. Hence this attempt to, to present a framework to unpack the concept of organized crime. So this is a framework uh, we have published in several places. And what we try to do is to take three basic concepts from, you could say, economic sociology or basic, uh, basic economics or basic sociology, uh, production, trade, and governance. So what we are arguing is that there are some people in, in what is normally considered organized crime uh, that are actually involved in the production of goods and services. So people on the field in, in parts of Latin America, uh, the same as in Burma, producing heroin or um, counterfeit goods in China. The people that are there, in effect, are organized in small uh, workshops, in small firms, and they are ultimately producers of goods and services. Now, what we argue, and of course, I know my time is limited, so I don't have a lot of time to expand on this. What we argue is that uh, production is very different from another kind of activity, which is um, not so much the production of the goods, but the movement of these goods from one place to another. So uh, under the label of trade, the concept of trade, we include all kinds of activities that are uh, involved in moving the goods from one place uh, to another. And by goods, of course, I also mean people. So what we normally call human trafficking, human smuggling, drugs trafficking, money laundering, uh, also lots of cybercrime. Cybercrime, a lot of it is going online on forum or fora and to buy and sell illegal, illegal information or illegal you know, numbers of credit cards. So again, what you do there is that somebody has, has stolen or produced the goods 
and somebody wants to buy them and there is an exchange between these two people. And so this is a basic trading activity. In the case of drugs, as you know, there is a lot of money to be made in moving the drugs from one place to another. And we also argue that the people involved in the trading are very different from those who are involved in the production. They have a different set of skills. Often they are international businessmen. Maybe they have a um, very high technical skills. Um, and so we uh, postulate that um, uh, we need to uh, identify trading as a separate activity from production. And then let me come to the, the point of this, uh, of this seminar and this panel, namely governance. So not only people produce and trade goods and services, they, there is also, uh, there are institutions or groups that set themselves up as those who give permission to others to produce and to trade. This is exactly the function of states ultimately. And uh, um, this is, happens also in illegal markets. And so we argue that there is a special type of criminal organization that specializes in governance. And what do they do? Well, they do activities that actually are not that dissimilar from what you expect from a well-functioning uh, government or state dispute settlement protection against competition, which is a very valuable uh, service provided often by the mafia, the traditional mafias in places like um, Southern Italy, uh, protection against thieves, labor racketeering, intimidation of lawful right orders. Um, so you have the right to a house, to a flat, but this governance institution comes along and gives the right to somebody else. They recover that and something quite sophisticated that has been highlighted first by John Landesco and then Peter Reuter and Diego Gambetta is the enforcement of cartel agreements. All of these are very, very different activities from producing cocaine in a field uh, or cocaine leaves or moving the cocaine from one place to another. So we argue that there is a special type of criminal activity involved in the governance. Now, something that we're also interested in exploring further is how an organization that may be starting off as a trading criminal organization move or transition into governance, under which conditions this might happen or not. Something that, of course, I don't have the time to discuss here. So to conclude this general part of my talk, you could call it the theory, I can say that the effort that uh, we have been making is to give analytical substance to the concept of organized crime through a framework that isolates the governance as a special activity uh, that uh, criminal groups do. Of course, it's not the only activity and, uh, and that activity can be done by criminal groups. Often it's also done by corrupt uh, police. Uh, officers or, or institutions, so it's not necessarily criminals. Now, the, let me, I, as, I, as I know the time is, is running, I want now to turn to um, a preliminary work that we have been doing, as Paolo was saying, on, uh, on the United Kingdom this time, in England, in fact, as opposed to the traditional places, uh, on measuring, measuring uh, governance. So we think that uh, even in a, in a context like England, uh, there is uh, this particular kind of function uh, performed by criminal groups. So we want to measure this with an instrument. And so we developed such an instrument. So measuring legal governance, I hope you can see it. Uh, measuring legal governance, and we have created a questionnaire called the iGov questionnaire, which has gone through a number of iterations. And we try to capture through this instrument uh, uh, several dimensions, which we think are related to governance. The ability of the group to generate fear, to force legal business to do what they want, to influence public officials, and especially to control illicit markets. And as the point that we should make here is that uh, the governance function preys on the community. And so these uh, we expect um, such groups uh, to, um, to play a role in the community as well. So the full instrument includes five, uh, five dimensions. And then organized crimes are scored from zero to four on this dimension. And one of the way we have been trying to implement the, the survey or the instrument is to ask police officers who have kindly agreed to collaborate with us 
to, to just fill in the question as for the area they know best. Hence, we can produce a, a, some result. Now, what I'm going to show in the last uh, two slides, I think I have, is some very preliminary results, just to give you a sense of what can be done with this um, uh, instrument. So this is a, um, the, the iGov index applied to uh, a, in a large UK force. Uh, this version of the index only had three dimensions, um, fear, business coercion, and influence in public, um, over public officials. So the, the index has gone through uh, some iteration and, and modification, but the purpose of this slide here is only to give you a sense uh, uh, a sense of um, how it works. And it refers to 94 organized crime groups in a particular large police force in, um, in the UK, which I shall not mention for, for the time being. And so what you can see is that we simply add up the, the scores and you have some, you have got some groups, in this case nine, who actually are, have got um, are zero on all, um, on all accounts. And then you go from, so no GAV to low level of what we call low level of GAV to medium level of GAV to high level of GAV, of GAV, i.e. governance. And again, this is what, in a sense, we expect. We expect the governance type organized crime to be rare, to be rare because it's very hard to set up an organized crime group that is actually able to prey on a community uh, in a long-term way to prey and influence business, to control illegal markets. And so this is the kind of uh, shape of the, of the curve that you expect to find in which there is very few who are high on GOV, on iGov index, uh, some who are just not involved in government at all. Um, and then in the medium, you would find some, um, some numbers and some cases. And of course, this index will also help us uh, um, identify groups that might be transiting from medium to high. Um, now, the next uh, slide, um, which I should hope I should be able to produce, it's uh, we can also map, of course, all, all of these results. And in this case, we have been placing illegal governance in um, in in on communities. This is, I think I can say this is London. There are three boroughs in London. We have used the particular um, geographical inst geographical definition, which is called middle layer super output areas, which is part of the census uh, produced by the United Kingdom, uh, the official for the, the Office for National Statistics. So it's a geographical area which has got average population of some seven thousand and two hundred uh, people. And again, what we try to do here is to give you a sense of the gradients of governance in. Uh, in these three boroughs of London. And I hope you can see that the darker, the darker the area, the more GAV we expect, we, we find in the, through our instrument. So let me, let me bring to an end. I think what I can say is that um, uh, the concept of organized crime still has got a future. I think it still can be used, but in order to be used sensibly, it has to be unpacked. And we have unpacked it, uh, identifying three key uh, sub elements, production, trade, and governance. And then uh, part uh, of our work is actually to measure the third part and to find it in places where you would not expect to find it or where it has not ever been found or never been studied really, which is uh, England as opposed to traditional high level so called organized crime territories. So I will end it here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Federico. And uh, um, well, we, we got a question for you, but we'll get to the question uh, uh, later uh, in the Q&A session. Now we continue on illegal governance. We move to Mexico uh, with uh, uh, Salome Flores from uh, UNODC Mexico in Eki. Uh, Salome, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Paolo, and thanks for supporting the organization of, of the conference. This is really exciting for us to, to be here in this panel and have the opportunity to share our experience in uh, measuring for the very first time illegal governance, and, and it has been uh, such a ride. 
uh, and I'll, I'm happy to, to talk about it uh, with all of you today. Um, well, I'm going to switch to Spanish because I can speak Spanish and I think it would be easier, but my presentation is uh, in English, so it's easier for everyone to follow. Um, I think you can see it and, and you can uh, hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you and we can see it. All good. <laughs> Okay, okay, so I'll start. So uh, my presentation is about, ah, I'm gonna switch. My presentation is the impact well, of the government. My presentation has to do with the illegal impact and organized crime and sustainable development. We did this in a place called Iztapalapa, one of the districts in Mexico City. Dr. Varese gave us a very broad framework theoretical conceptual framework of organized crime and how they measured this in London. We at UNODC in Mexico, we heard about this experience. We coincided with their analysis. We were about to start within the framework of an assessment we call urban safety governance assessment where we selected a territory uh, in Mexico City to understand and analyze internal, external threats, how they limit sustainable development and hamper, harm, and violate resilience in the community of Iztapalapa. The idea was also to understand risk factors associated to violence and crime and how those risk factors interact with external illicit flows, many times linked to other national territories or even with transnational implications. This analysis, the objective is public policies based on collected information we wanted to identify prioritary areas and strategies to prevent crime. Depending on what we found through this analysis, we also wanted to assess local authority capacity, not only of one place, but the entire district as per principles of good governance. That's why we wanted to do this. Good governments, that's what we wanted to find. On the right hand side, we have the principles of good governance, which are the eight principles authorities would have to follow to really do their job in a participatory, effective manner, always with the rule of law present. This was done simultaneously in four cities, in four countries, Nairobi, Kenya, in Uzbekistan, Barbados, and here in Mexico City in the Iztapalapa district. What is Iztapalapa? So that you can get to know this territory, you have the map of Mexico City here, and you can see in green the Iztapalapa district, 7.6% of Mexico City's territory, and it is the most populated borough in the city, almost 2 million people. Distribution by sex, almost egalitarian, you see 51.6, 48.4 men, 35% people live in poverty, 45% have economic activities on trade and services, more than half monthly income, $320, and uh, five of 10 prisons in Mexico City are located in Iztapalapa and a total of 2,745 policemen serving in Estapalapa. This means that there an average of 150 policemen per 100,000 inhabitants in Estapalapa, half of the average that our UNODC has published saying there should be 300 policemen per 100,000 inhabitants. So in Estapalapa, we have half of the average we have found in other cities. This is the analysis with two ramifications. One is broader, not just the legal governance. We also analyze different aspects. For instance, as of statistical geographic information, we're able to understand 
the uh, social demographic characteristics of this population, economic dynamics as well. And then of course we use statistical information on crimes, especially from official sources to understand what crimes were taking place in a five year period. And we also did a geographic analysis to understand the concentration of crime and risk factors associated to that concentration. We use those data to understand dimension behaviors where they were taking place, but we didn't just stop at the quantitative part of this. We also did a qualitative analysis, gathering information from different groups in the territory in different communities, 44 different uh, locations in Mexico City. We included leaders, housewives, and uh, housekeepers, civil society organizations. And we also did interviews with uh, public servants, with public officials. And finally, we were able to do a survey with police officers mainly, and this has to do with illegal governance and organized crime. These are the results I wanted to share with you. What we did was to adapt this questionnaire you developed with those five dimensions. We added a few questions. We did the questionnaire. We applied the questionnaire online using Google Form to ensure confidentiality. So the response rate was quite high, but it didn't allow us to do geo reference of the information. And this is over half of the policemen working that they were interviewed. This is what we included in this survey. This, first of all, has to do with organized crime groups, their presence, the mechanisms of control that they have over the territory and illicit markets that they're using in that territory. We also included a second section to understand the role of the community and how they interact with those uh, organized crime groups. Finally, we added a third section to analyze and understand the police integrity and the identification of actions of corruption and how they were following the codes of ethics in those corporations main findings organized criminal groups and illicit markets more than half of the policemen were telling us their say level of uh, here very high level of fear caused by the presence of organized crime in the community a little over half of them said they perceived a strong and high coercion level because of the organized groups in the community. And we also saw that the organized uh, criminal organized group had an impact on community activities, a very high level of that. Now, uh, the uh, ever present was the illicit uh, drug trafficking, 81% of that illicit market, counterfeiting trafficking, 60 50, rather 6% of counterfeiting, trafficking, and uh, illicit arms market. Based on the analysis we did as of statistical information, we didn't find as of those data evidence, important evidence on merchandise trafficking, this forfeiting in the proportion that allowed us to uh, see illegal governments in terms of the role of the community 46 percent said that community facilitates organized crime activities and also an important interaction in the community with organized uh, criminal groups uh, there are family relations that are very close and there's also a normality and the presence of organized crime groups in this territory. In terms of the police integrity, uh, the uh, police officials were telling us it is possible to identify acts of corruption. And they said that some of them, and we understand this is a direct testimony, they said there's a high level of respect for the codes of ethics. And they also said a lesser degree that the organized crime groups had a relative influence 
on the police corporations in, in the territory of Iztalapa. These are the main findings we have. The truth is that in this very brief presentation, we're just showing you the main findings, but the full report on uh, good governance and illicit governance, as well as recommendations of public policies are available in the report that I will be sharing with you in case you are interested in looking at it. Just to conclude, these findings, uh, let me tell you, it was important for us to understand how this illegal governance and organized crime and the presence of it in this territory had an impact on sustainable development. First, we saw that illicit markets are seen as an opportunity for some people, organized crime offers an opportunity, which is an economic opportunity to increase their income. And we also found that this can be an activity giving a social status and control of the territory and of the community. And that finally has very important consequences on the community and people individually, since it limits opportunities for development. Some people, for instance, in some districts in Mexico City and some individuals are uh, uh, as well are obligated to be part of organized crime activities uh, without any option. They're afraid and they are being uh, co-opted. There's a lot of coercion. These mechanisms have also not allowed for the development of economic activities. We have found people who have had the intention of initiating a business, but they decide not to do it because of the important presence of those criminal groups. And finally, there's also an impact in terms of the level of trust in the community, also in terms of trusting the authorities or going to see the authorities for a complaint or de to denounce these activities, people are afraid and um, uh, because of coercion and those groups do not allow citizens to go and file a complaint vis-a-vis -vis the authorities. These are some of the main findings, but there is no doubt that for us and the authorities, uh, we uh, have clear indications on the mechanisms that we would have to strengthen, especially at the community level to strengthen resilience and social aspects. Well, and also, of course, to strengthen police integrity. We invite you to know the full report. This is the website. You can see the QR code of the English version. It's also available in Spanish for those of you who want to consult it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Salome. Uh, muchas gracias. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, well, we'll come back in the in the Q and A. But uh, um, uh, you, this fantastic job that you did uh, on uh, uh, on looking at uh, illegal governance uh, in uh, part of Mexico City, and uh, I particularly like the fact that you have emphasized the 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 role of the local places, the community, and governance uh, uh, starts from uh, uh, communities, uh, and then uh, uh, can uh, unfortunately uh, grow. Um, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to much, much bigger level. Uh, we now uh, go back to Europe uh, and we go to Sweden, a, a place where we, we, place we would normally not associate with issues of uh, illegal governance and, and criminal governance. Um, and uh, I give now the floor to Johanna Skinner uh, that uh, really has uh, um, a fantastic presentation and uh, insightful presentation. To I little uh, um, spoiler, we, we were together in another conference and uh, I, I enjoyed your presentation already. Joanna, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Paolo. I'm going to see if I can start my presentation. Uh, the pandemic taught me things I thought I'd never learn about um, technical things and viruses. Can you see the presentation? Yes, sir. Perfectly. Thank you. Good. 
I'm more comfortable talking about criminology. Thank you so much for this invitation. I feel honored to be part of this session. I'm going to talk about an exciting project we did a few years ago. Uh, I work for a research division at the Swedish National Council for Crime Prevention, where we specialize at researching economic and organized crime. And uh, the, we, here we looked into socially disadvantaged areas. So we looked at whether the residents felt safe in their community, if they trusted the authorities. And the third part was to look at the existence of parallel societal structures. And I'm going to focus on that part in my presentation. And a socially disadvantaged area in, in Sweden, uh, there you find extensive problems with economic and ethnic seg segregation. We have high levels of unemployment, poor results regarding education, uh, also quite at least compared to other parts of Sweden, a widespread feeling of unsafety among the residents. And we also have quite visible criminality. Here you can find open drug markets and there has been, uh, compared to other parts of Sweden, a large portion of, of shootings, mainly among criminals, but it really affects the community as a whole. And moving to the second slide, if I can get that to work. I spoke too soon. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you can see a second slide where the words research methods are found. Yes. Good. Uh, the unique thing with this study was because these um, socially disadvantaged areas are very disputed in the Swedish debate and there's been a lot of focus, say, the past five years in what's going on there, because in a way it's a new crime situation in, in Sweden. And we wanted to know more about how the residents felt, the law-abiding citizens who live there. So we did interviews in six particularly disadvantaged areas, so sort of the worst in the group. We spoke to almost 120 people. There were police officers, local authorities, business owners. And then we did quite an ambitious door-to-door -door survey where we knocked on people's doors and we got almost 1,200 residents to talk to us in two of these areas. And they, that was actually 43% of the households. So we got a good view of what it was like to live in these areas. And we also focused on getting answers from both men and women and young and old. Uh, so we could do analysis on those two variables. And when we then had to talk about parallel societal structures, we, we realized that that was a very, that was a phrase that led to very strong feelings and a bit of confusion. What is a parallel societal structure? structure? So what we did was that we looked at what kind of functions do you find in the Swedish mainstream society in the welfare state? And what kind of alternative or parallel systems can you have to fill the same functions? And these were the eight dimension that we thought of both in, in theoretical works, in previous research, and most importantly, in our own data. And the first two dimensions are the ones that I think relate most to this session, administration of justice, where you kind of have your own courts and verdicts within um, a social group. But we also saw examples of alternative banking and payment systems where Havala is probably the most well known, but some people have their own cash, uh, cash system. If you ever come to Sweden, you will notice that no one uses cash here. We, the rest of us pay with bank cards, debit cards. But in this sphere, we saw a lot of cash being used. Some also had their own insurance or social welfare systems. We also saw cases of extortions, like we heard from, from Mexico. Uh, we could also see examples of an alternative job market, a listed market for jobs. Uh, also the same with a housing market that is quite regulated in the Swedish mainstream society. 
We saw a few examples of private schools with other norms, but they were very rare. And regarding monopoly, we looked at if you sold tobacco or alcohol illicitly uh, in, a, in a circle. So what kind of groups did we find that we could connect to this uh, diffuse um, <laughs> word, parallel societal structures? Well, we find two, two types of distinct groups. The, the main group that had this type of structure were organized crime in the same definition that, that Frederico told you about. Uh, but some of these were more like criminal networks working in the local community selling drugs, so they were quite fluent. Uh, here we found it's men who joined, mainly men. They have some female members, but not that many. They may refer to things as being in the group's interest, but many are individualists, and especially the leaders, they tend to, to do things their own way, and the group are often working in their interest. Uh, they don't really care that much about the residents in the area, unless they can sell things to them, so they are customers or if they are witnesses and victims and you don't want them to talk to the police, so therefore you use intimidation. And most of the things they do is in a parallel structure. They're not that interested in the sort of mainstream society. And then we found another type of group that used parallel structures. And those groups were either based on ethnicity or family ties or religion. And here you find a more true collective logic. They were genuinely formed as a group. They were quite patriarchal. So men had more power in these groups. They described more positive feelings about their group. They trusted each other. They felt loyal to the group. And here you were either born into the group or socialized into the group. So the ties were a lot closer and you were not likely to, to change groups, but the criminals could do that. They could join their enemy group anytime. And here they try to influence their members. So they're not that interested in outsiders because the norms in the group do not apply to the other residents. And the tr tricky part here is that they act both in the parallel structures and in mainstream society. And I think, think that helped cause the confusion with this terminology because people who had a strong position in the mainstream society, perhaps as a business, local business owner or uh, a spokesperson for a religious community, uh, they also had a very strong position in the parallel structure acting as a mediator. Uh, and also we could see that some things that are criminalized in the Swedish penal code were not seen as criminal in these groups, but rather something we do that's okay in our small community. This is some results from the door to door survey where we asked the almost 1200 people if they felt that they were influenced by a certain type of group. So we asked, have you been sort of not able to call the police, not allowed to be a witness of a crime? Are you restricted so you cannot move freely in this area? Or have you been refrained from stopping vandalism because of another group? And most people said that criminal groups influenced them in such a way. So they refrain from doing things, especially women. Over 70% of the women in these two areas said that that was the case and over 60% of the men. And then we added the numbers for religious group, family tie group or uh, ethnic group. And just over 10% of the women and men said that they had the same type of influence. So this proves that it's really the criminality that's the main issue here, not the other types of groups. And of course, in practice, they can overlap. But this is a short presentation, so you get the simplified version. And I thought we'd look at one of the dimensions, that is the administration of justice regarding criminal cases. So if we look at the results regarding the criminal groups, 
we see that it is the parallel or alternative system that you use because you won't call the police if you're victimized. Uh, normally, these crimes take place within the criminal environment, within the criminal networks, and the penalty is usually fines, you pay money, or you're exposed to violence, sometimes quite severe violence. Um, we see a few exceptions that are cases where criminal networks, people in the drug markets that settle things on behalf of residents. Uh, in one case, a man was battered and knifed by another criminal, and this the, the victim was a normal resident. And the, the uh, drug, drug gang wanted to help him get compensation so he wouldn't call the police and give the police an, a, a reason to, to check the area and to disturb their drug operation. And that's really concerning because then you do have a bit of actual governance. But we only see a few cases of that. The other types of groups, those connected to religion, family or ethnicity, they can use the alternative systems that they provide. Uh, but they say, especially the mediators that we interviewed, that if it's a severe case, then you need to call the police. But if you have a crime that affects the group as a whole, then it can be solved within this system. And that means that crimes that take place within the family are often settled here quite informally. Uh, and they say that individuals can choose. But when we look at the data, it seems like powerful people within this uh, environment, they can choose if they want to use the police or this alternative system. But for most people, they just have to adjust to what others choose for them. These systems can also interfere with the mainstream criminal justice system because people withdraw, they don't want to be a witness or they take back what they said in previous interviews. And sometimes in a few cases there was a verdict, uh, but the, the case had already been settled in the quicker parallel system. So you had to re-regulate the compensation um, because they had all, already paid fines. And normally these groups uh, punish through fines and they seldom use violence, but of course there are exceptions. And what are some of the most important conclusions in this study? Well, the main advantage with the parallel structures that our interviewees really emphasized is that they are quick, they are easy to access, they are open 24 seven. You don't need an interpreter because you can speak your first language. And sometimes it's the only alternative because you don't trust the Swedish authorities or you don't know which authority to call because you don't have the knowledge about the societal uh, functions. Uh, the groups that use these alternative functions are often patriarchal and are based on a collective logic. So that means that it's really the group before the individual. And this is a big exception to, to what Sweden is normally like. We have really strong uh, powers for the individual and we talk a lot about equal rights. And this goes against that logic. We also found what was even more severe that some residents, they do not belong to a group that have a community and these societal functions and they don't trust the state. So they are left without any type of pr protection in an environment where crime is, is happening and quite visible. And the, the main, of course, uh, worry here is that especially if you look at administrative, uh, the, the alternative justice regarding crimes and civil matters is that it causes both harm for the individual and in a sense harm for the system because it brings people out of the mainstream criminal justice system and it creates, um, uh, well, not an equal situation and especially women and children and maybe families with a weak position within the system they risk being disadvantaged uh, and getting smaller fines and some 
We also see some cases where they are forced to stay with partners that abuse them or stay with children that are battered by family members. So it can have really severe consequences. And that was uh, my presentation. And uh, the full report is available in Swedish if you want to read more. And it's also translated in full to, into English at our website, bra.se. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, Johanna. And, uh, and again, congratulations again for the study that you have done uh, um, at Bra. Uh, it, it is really amazing what you have achieved in terms of um, interviews in the community and, uh, and and the findings that you have uncovered, uh, in a sense, uh, it's, uh, and we can discuss this later as well, it's really important to have an early uh, red flags about what is going on in, in parts of the society, uh, even in, in countries where overall uh, the, the institutions are very strong and uh, corruption is low and there is no uh, systemic risk uh, at, the, at, the, at the nation level. But to have these uh, um, very um, uh, early stage approaches, uh, I think it's really important. And the testimony from Sweden and the work you are doing, uh, it's, it is fantastic. Uh, um, uh, so thank you so much. And we'll continue later. Uh, we have a little bit of time for the discussion. Uh, we now fly back, uh, unfortunately, only virtually uh, to Latin America. Uh, well, we all can't wait to, to see the back of COVID and to uh, go back and flying for real uh, to uh, Santiago Tobon. Thank you so, so much, Santiago, for being with us today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Paolo. Thank you, Salome, and all the organizers for the invitation. Let me share my screen now. Uh, can you confirm that you're looking at my slides now? Yes, so we are looking just slides. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'm going you to- You are not in presentation mode. Yeah, no, this is the PDF, like the Adobe uh, Reader, right? Right, and the yeah. slide is slightly cut at the bottom. Let me just- Ah, okay, perfect. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Is You're it good to go. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Paolo. So I'm going to present to you uh, a work that we're uh, I've been working for quite uh, some years now, five years. Also, I'm going to switch to Spanish because I, I'm going to follow um, um, Salome on this. Este es un trabajo en el que llevamos con Chris Bladman, Gustavo Duncan. This is a work that we did together with Chris, Gustavo, since five years ago, because we want to learn how this phenomena is working, uh, criminal governance in the Medellin context. The purpose of this project was to collect a lot of information. And as we have collected information, we have focused on two issues. Why agency, agencies in, government, in the government are doing this and what the government can do about that. The availability of criminal gangs to govern. This is Medellin. This is 15 or 20 people, mainly men, and they sell drugs and they have other services. Informal loans they pay debts and have a monopoly. There are pictures here of some years ago. You can imagine a stereotype of young men who are quite violent. And another one we were interviewing, as I will tell you right now, how did it happen? How did it begin? We have two sources of information, qualitative work through interviews at the community, how they relate to criminal groups and community members. 
and we interviewed criminal groups. Many of those people were in jail to understand the reasons they had to do what they did. We interviewed experts and quantitative work we did as well. The combos, where are they? This is a map of Medellin. Here you see social economic strata, the darker colors, and then the combos. This is through a combos survey we did. The combos are all over the city, regardless of the income level. The only parts where they're not present is in lower income areas, about 350 combos in the city of Medellin, and more or less 50 in the metropolitan area. What did we do to start documenting this phenomenon? A survey in the different communities. We were asking them about the frequency in which citizens go to the state to solve security, justice systems, and how frequent did they go to the combos, to the gangs, to solve insecurity problems. Someone is making noise, a motorbike was stolen, you have to get money from someone who hasn't paid you a debt. This is the average. In general terms, citizens have a relatively high frequency. They go to, to the gang members, but they first go to the state structure and then the gangs. An average, when they feel insecure, then they go see the gangs. And this happens in the medium and low income communities. There are many variations, however. This is the average index of gang governance, the combo governance. The darker red, more government activities are in charge of the gangs. And there are many places in the cities. This might surprise many of you. We're trying to document this phenomenon. A lot of the communities, the boroughs, this is Villa Hermosa. It's very well known. And this is the northeastern part with a lot of criminal gang control. And in the other ones, there's still less control. A first question, why do the criminal groups do this? For what reasons? Perhaps the first one is territorial control through security services. This is their business line. We were asking people, how easy is it to contact combo groups how fast do they respond? How easy is it to contact authorities or the police forces? In general terms, the gangs offer differentiated services. They're more efficient and you can contact them faster than the police or any government official. In Medellin, the services of the gangs have two sources of incomes. One is like the subscription. People at the stores pay a quota, a fee, a monthly fee. And then there's a single payment for some type of specific solution to a problem. For instance, street problems. The gang takes care of anyone annoying neighbors in the community. So here we study two things. I will not go into technical details. This is the causal effect of some changes in Medellin jurisdictions in 1987. Some communities, here we see two communities, Popular and Santa Cruz, the red dots are people 
in our survey. In 1987, these are the borders we introduced, jurisdictions for police services and to solve disputes. These jurisdictions created a discontinuity among the neighbors. You see these triangles and those squares, those are police stations. So the homes right here are closer to the police station and the ones on the right are further away. So what happened when these borders were introduced? Were citizens closer to police forces? Do they go to the police men to fix their problems? Well, they're closer to the authority. Do they use those services? What we didn't expect was that being closer to the state, the fact the state intensified its presence meant would, this meant that people would go more talk to the gangs. So more state presence generated more demand of state services, but also more demand from gang services. We did another experiment. We took 80 Medellin communities, you see them here. At random, we selected 40 of them for the mayor's office to have services there. First, full-time employee serving citizens from the mayor's office. The second, mass events organized by the local government. This is the coexistence caravan. What did we find? Territories where the state was present, citizens said they used the state less and more the gangs. So the major question, I said, it seems that the gangs are governing your community. So the state intensified its presence when this happened. The gang presence increased and also gang services for the community increased. We spoke to members of the gangs and people in the community. We found two reasons for this. One, when the gangs have more territorial control, more government services in the community, the community has less crime and the authorities are not so present. This means that they have, they can sell drugs, the gangs can sell drugs and take bribes from the people. What we found is that they're trying to increase their presence so the gangs are ever present and the authorities cannot go in those communities. So security services are in the hands of the criminal gangs. So the more government officials are in the community and the more the gangs help the community, the less complaints the community will have against the criminal gangs. This means the following general conclusions. Unlike what we imagine, getting money from extortions is not the reason for the gangs to have government activities. It's externalities for other business lines. This is the direct profit reason. It's a very complex situation for the government to avoid this phenomenon because intuition says go have more services in that community, but it's a complex situation. We think more qualitative work is necessary. We have to talk to the criminal groups to understand their dynamics and the actions they do at the community level. And this is very important for successful public policies. This is the team on this project. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Santiago. Um, and thanks for the presentation. Thanks you for the uh, excellent, uh, presenting your excellent uh, 
uh, field work that you and the team has done. And uh, it's really impressive uh, the, the, the type of interviews that you have managed to do and the combination between uh, uh, different types of quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, methods uh, and, uh, and the findings. I particularly like, and then I open the discussion, uh, we already have some questions, but I particularly like that the fact that, well, some of the mechanisms that you highlighted are, well, similar to the mechanism that uh, uh, we see in other, uh, in other places. And, uh, um, and you have a slide where actually the people you interview, they said actually they would, they would, be, they would prefer to be without the criminal governance. Uh, so that was important to remember that uh, communities uh, are, in, are uh, often uh, the first victim uh, of this type of governance or this suboptimal equilibrium uh, where they might find themselves in and they, uh, from which it's very difficult to get out, as you, uh, you shown, it's not just a matter of uh, increased police presence or even uh, increasing uh, services. Um, uh, but nonetheless, when asked, they said, well, we would very much prefer to be in a situation that uh, uh, there is no, uh, no governance. So how do we get there uh, is uh, the million dollar uh, question that uh, um, uh, you have gone some way to, to answer and, and other, uh, in other, uh, other scholars have done in other places. So that's, uh, uh, that's really fantastic. And uh, uh, it's really the question that we should all be working on, like how to get out from this uh, uh, very bad and detrimental equilibrium. Um, now I have uh, uh, questions in the Q and A, uh, which uh, are some of them in uh, in, in Spanish and some uh, in, uh, in in English. Uh, uh, Salome and the team in in Mexico City have done a brilliant job in translating uh, uh, the, the Spanish one. Um, so I'll start with the, I, I go in order, and uh, uh, and I'll start with a question for Federico. Um, well, the first one is not really a question, it's actually saying whether you, you or we can share the questionnaire, um, the, the iGov uh, questionnaire, um, to which... Uh, um, yeah, so, so, <laughs> sorry about my video, I thought it better if I don't use it because of my internet. Um, yes, of course, I think uh, we are very happy to share it, that's a short answer. <laughs> Just contact uh, uh, us, you or, or myself, uh, and we'll take it from there. The other question we have is that whether uh, you can say something more about uh, uh, the community aspects uh, and uh, and uh, the measurement of the of uh, of the community, uh, the infiltration of organized crime in the community. What specific measures are used? Uh, yes, so if we are, are interested in the extent to which the gang is able to uh, have a presence, for instance, in community events, uh, in the local clubs, whether they are present, and so whether they host events which are community oriented. That's, I think, one of the key uh, indicators of community presence. Uh, yes, uh, uh, and if I can add to that, uh, we also yes. had uh, in the in, not in the uh, iGov uh, um, quantitative questionnaire, but in a, um, in a qualitative questionnaires that uh, uh, goes uh, together with the quantitative one with uh, um, uh, community members and uh, and the key informants in the community. We also look at uh, uh, issues around dispute settlement. Uh, and uh, uh, keeping the peace in the communities and solving uh, um, issues both in the illegal and the legal uh, uh, market disputes uh, around disputes, uh, etc. So it is multifaceted. The, the iGov questionnaires, in a sense, strives to be as short as possible uh, to gain uh, um, the largest possible cooperation from, from police officers that are normally overburned. But there is a much longer qualitative uh, questionnaire. And I think uh, uh, from uh, all the, the presentations today, if I might say this, we have seen the value of uh, integrating quantitative and qualitative uh, um, approaches. Yes, and if I may also add, we also were extremely 
concern that we shouldn't just have the view of the police, right? So the, what I didn't have time to say in the presentation is what Paolo just mentioned, that we have a separate set of questions that we do with community activists, uh, community leaders, uh, political, local politicians. And uh, that in a sense will complement, should complement the, the police view of, and that's when we have questions on uh, the, the gang's activities to, to do with events and uh, community activities, yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Federico. Uh, I have a couple of questions for uh, Salome that I'm sure you have read in Spanish, but I'll read it in, in, in the English translation uh, for the benefit of the, of the panel. And, and the first one is whether you have some views on how or what can be done to encourage a citizen uh, uh, confidence to denounce, uh, um, I guess, instances of illegal governance and crime. And uh, there is an issue that has been brought up in the Q&A that uh, there is a data portal that probably is too transparent and, uh, and gives away too much information about the victim uh, um, that is reporting a crime, hence, uh, um, uh, potentially backfiring in, uh, in crime reporting. Yeah, I'm gonna try. Yeah, I, I knew it. Hold on. Okay. Um, well, this, this issue of reporting any activities to the police is uh, it's a very challenging issue, and particularly in the, in the Mexican context. You know that there is a national victimization survey conducted by the National Statistical Office in Mexico, in Neji, and um, they publish the results every year. And, and basically, only like 10% of the crimes are reported to the police. So this is a big issue, I mean, nationally and, and locally as well. And what we see is that... Um, Actually, from the survey, you can understand what are the reasons for people not to report to the to the authorities, not only police, but any other uh, authorities. And and there are many reasons, really. I mean, but uh, some of them are because there is no trust in the authorities, because they believe that uh, nothing is going to happen with the report, um, and they believe also that uh, it's too bureaucratic. So I guess, in a way, I mean, we all know that having more people reporting helps a lot in uh, understand, I mean, having a clear dimension of the number of conducts that are occurring and, and the types of behaviors that are occurring. But also, if we report, we give the authorities more information that eventually could be used to tackle uh, different criminal behaviors in the field. So um, I think uh, the authorities can do a lot with this information to really invite the, uh, all citizens and all the, all the people to report. Um, we have thought, uh, discussed this a lot about creating new mechanisms, online mechanisms, and, and not necessarily ask the victims to go in person to report the file uh, to, the, to the police. Um, so yeah, I think uh, authorities can do a lot to improve reporting mechanisms. And about the data portal that you mentioned, I didn't read the question, but um, I'm sure it's not a national, a national uh, portal. Uh, but that's also a concern. I think uh, it's something that actually from, from a UNODC perspective would be very important to look at because there is a discussion about what data should be uh, publicly available. So this is, so. I mean, I will go back and take a look at the question because it's, it's definitely very relevant, uh, generally speaking, for understanding what, what information um, it's collecting the authorities, but also what information is available publicly. Yes, uh, I think uh, the portal is a Mexico City portal. Um, it's, it's for Mexico City, uh, from what I can understand. And uh, well, thank you so much, Salome. It's uh, this issue of, uh, of reporting and measuring, is, it's, it, it is a very complicated one. It probably can only be solved with multiple sources. Um, there is a second question for you, Salome, and it's uh, about uh, um, social programs. So, so could the presence of uh, targeted uh, social programs uh, in uh, its tapalapa reduce crime and violence in the short term? Sorry, it's just, it's a very good question. Um, 
you know, we like to say that all policies, not only social programs, but even crime prevention policies need, need time. You know, we need to, to uh, we need some time to implement them and to actually see the results. So um, I would I would say that, uh, of course, uh, having social programs uh, that are really targeted to, to a special uh, vulnerable groups in the community could be uh, effective. I mean, in Iztapalapa, what we found, because like I mentioned, we, we studied the, the whole uh, social and, and criminal dynamics in the territory and, and I mean, beyond the legal governance. So what we saw is that um, the authorities are really uh, working a lot in, in the social policies and targeting uh, different strategies to different groups. And, and they're, they're having interest uh, results. But one of the problems that they face is the dimension of, of, the, of the territory, but also the size of the population, you know? So, so I mean, just to answer very briefly, uh, it's, it's worth investing in social programs, but they definitely need more investment to, to really uh, be able to reach all the population that should be targeted with this kind of policies. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, in a sense, it's also what, uh, uh, I mean, Salome, what you're saying is in line with Santiago saying that uh, uh, sometimes just uh, um, doing a, a small step in the right direction might not be enough. And uh, well, in the case of Santiago, it might even backfire. So in a sense, uh, uh, one has to go full speed, uh, um, uh, but there are resource implication. And speaking of resources, uh, uh, Salome, you have another question. And um, they ask you, um, I'm kind of translating directly from Spanish, the, uh, so the, the, the resource-wise, uh, how much time and money, uh, whether this is resource intensive, the work that you have done uh, for the urban security, and whether uh, you, uh, as UNODC Mexico, you have thought about expanding this type of work uh, to other uh, um, city uh, in, in, in the region? I guess in, in, yes, in the Yes, thank you. Um, well, um, this is a global initiative. It's uh, actually, it's called UNOD City. And, uh, and as I explained, uh, it was implemented in four cities at the same time. Of course, we're aiming to expand these kinds of exercises and uh, we are looking actually the, the opportunities to do so in other countries. We would very much be interested in, in replicating this exercise. Uh, it takes between six and eight months. And in terms of uh, resources, well, we do have a team that it's uh, multidisciplinary. And uh, yeah, I guess if someone is, is interested, I would ask them to contact me and perhaps we can discuss about uh, the resources that we need to conduct some, some exercise like this one. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, well, I think, uh, um, I mean, one lesson from this panel is that uh, uh, certainly mm, there are three, uh, three main uh, um, avenues. Uh, one is to uh, continue to working on these indicators, and uh, um, and we probably need a set of global indi uh, indicators that are constant across uh, uh, context, but also more specific one. In fact, as you have done, Salome, you have uh, added to the to the indicators. Uh, the second is that we need to scale it up uh, in a way that is uh, systematic. And uh, scaling it up is uh, complicated, but not impossible. And, uh, but it's really need to be in a systematic way and not in a top down way. Like uh, we just look at newspaper articles and, and have a sense of what's going on, like top down systematic approach. And if I can add uh, also looking at evolution over time. So now we are talking about uh, one off, um, but uh, in a sense, uh, following up, um, uh, and try to understand the determinants of changes. Uh, it's, uh, it is equally important. Uh, I have a question uh, for uh, Santiago. Um, Santiago, considering the findings from your investigation, what would you expect to see if drugs were legalized? Would you expect a crime displacement to more violent markets? So we actually, we believe that the main 
uh, incentive for gangs to govern is to protect their illegal rents. So I would expect first, like lower levels of gang governance because they don't need to protect that rent anymore. And, and perhaps some groups would migrate to other illegal rents, but, but most of them might just turn legal because they can now sell drugs. Probably the, 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 the rents are going to be lower because uh, making drugs illegal makes rents higher, uh, but they will face like uh, fewer risks by just selling drugs uh, uh, going legal. So, so I, I would actually expect most of these groups to just turn uh, 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 to lower levels of, of gang governance and, and perhaps uh, uh, move in the direction of, of legalizing their, 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 their business. Also because for, for many of these uh, combos, the, the main uh, uh, illegal rent is actually marijuana sales. It's not even uh, cocaine sales. Most of the cocaine goes uh, uh, out of Colombia. So, 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 so yeah, I, I think they would just turn legal. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Santiago. Um, um, now, I have uh, uh, another question for you. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, well, reading that in Spanish and making sense it takes a little bit of time. Um, Actually, you have them in your email. Ah, fantastic. Um, well, I want that says, uh, basically, uh, when you talk about government services, uh, um, can you say a little bit more about what type of services uh, yeah. these groups are uh, providing and the same services that, in a sense, puts them in competition with the government? Because yeah. what I particularly like about your slides, if I can add, is that shows that these groups, the illegal governance groups we are talking about, they are in direct competition with the government. Uh, they are alternative and competitive in legal providers. So in your cases, so which type of services have you observed? Yeah, so, we, so there are like many dimensions of governance uh, and in many of these dimensions, gangs do not engage. So they don't provide, I don't know, uh, uh, school services or they don't, don't build like streets or, or, or stuff like that. Uh, we focus on our survey, on those services on which we found with our qualitative work that they were actually engaging in. And, and these are broadly two kinds of services. Uh, some services about dispute resolution. So problems between neighbors, uh, things related to garbage, to construction, uh, to the, the, the border between the two land plots, stuff like that. Uh, for which there are like specific agencies within the government that should be resolving these issues. Uh, in those situations, gangs engage a lot. And the other ones are about security services. So whether there was a theft in the street, uh, whether someone was attempting to, to, to do a robbery, stuff like that. In, in those kind of services, people also reach out to the gangs a lot. And, and, and the point that you, that you highlight is important. So because at the beginning, we actually did a baseline survey in which we asked people to whom they reached out more. But the, the, the question had the implicit competition that they were substitutes. So we're asking, do you go to the gang or do you go to the state? But in the end line survey, which is the one that I showed you, we actually had have, have the questions independently because we found out that gangs and the state are not necessarily substitutes, but sometimes compliments. And sometimes people just reach, reaches out to, 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 the, to the gang or to the state for specific dimensions of these services. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, that, that'll be it. Mostly about dispute resolution and security. Excellent, thank you. I, I have a question that it's for uh, uh, all of you and, uh, and it's the last question. And you can jump in uh, with, with a short answer. And it relates to COVID. And um, the two, 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 two parts to it, first is like, uh, well, uh, what do you think is will happen and whether COVID will have any impact on, uh, on this governance? Maybe we go back to exactly where, where we were. And uh, also what can be done to promote uh, um, citizen uh, um, participation in, uh, in, uh, in prevention activities? Uh, so the quick round table, what, would, what, do you, what do you think will be the impact of COVID, if any? 
uh, on, on the issues we are talking about? Well, may I start? I think, uh, I think uh, in cases where the government has proved particularly inefficient and resistant to understanding the threat of COVID, uh, some gangs, especially in the Latin American context, but also in, in Italy, have stepped up. I think in the case of, uh, of Latin America, there are examples in Brazil, examples in Colombia, in Mexico, in which you have seen gangs giving out health advice and enforcing lockdown, exactly doing governance in a sense, you know, protection, health protection. Now, it, this should not be exaggerated because as we know, these gangs cannot do very much ultimately. But I think uh, the, 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 there is a governance dimension that emerged in COVID to be quite important. The same in Italy, incidentally. I just read an investigation where somebody, a front for the mafia, was giving out masks, 5,000 masks in Palermo, uh, which was not well, uh, well known. So, uh, and then this will not be the first time because you have got crises in the past, like in the crisis in 1929. And Al Capone and Joe Bonanno in the Italian American mafia in New York and Chicago opened soup kitchens for the poor. So you do see this urge for legitimacy, which I think helps in the governance uh, of communities. And I think as the case of Medellin shows, this may be for other reasons, because you want to protect other markets, but the legitimacy in the community helps you run other businesses. So I think that's obviously COVID might hopefully go away at some point, uh, which is what we all hope. Um, I think that's my answer. I, I leave the others to continue. Excellent. Uh, but I bring in Johanna, if, uh, um, what is the experience uh, and what you have seen in, in, in Sweden lately? I would guess that COVID has a very, very small impact. We didn't have a formal lockdown. COVID was more widespread in these uh, socially disadvantaged areas. I think it has more impact because the police have been working really, really hard to fight the op open drug markets. And we also got a lot of data from the Anon and Sky and, and those things. And I think that really affected uh, the market in a sense that COVID uh, restrictions did not. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, Salome and then Santiago, we, we conclude. Uh, on COVID, on anything else you want to add in this uh, later? Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just thinking that, um, I mean, what Federico said before, we've seen that happening in, in Mexico a lot, really. I mean, the, some of the organized crime groups giving away um, different uh, products and even you know like the basic meals in some uh, places that are like poverty areas um, but I, I guess the opportunity for organized crime in COVID is really that there are new markets in which they can uh, participate I mean not, not only in Mexico but in other regions we saw that uh, some groups were already in the market of um, substandard and falsified medical products and, and and at some point they also discuss about the vaccine as, as a market as well you know uh, for organized crime so i mean i guess it it could have a, a, some some impact in in the terms of uh, creating new opportunities for new illicit activities thank you and santiago last word Yes, uh, just like two reactions. The first one is that I, in the case of Medellin, I wouldn't expect gang governance to change because the incentives are still there and are going to, to be there uh, once the pandemic is over, if, if, if it, that, that time comes at some point. Uh, and the second thing is that contrary to what we expected, uh, gangs did not engage a lot in COVID-related governance uh, during the pandemic and the, and the tougher times. We actually ran a survey about this, asking people whether they were reaching out to the gangs or whether gangs were providing some sort of services. And we found some, uh, this was very idiosyncratic. This was about like specific gang leaders that were just like caring more about the community maybe, or maybe finding like opportunities here, but, but, but this was not a systematic response uh, 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 that what we observed. Well, thank you so much. It's the last uh, minute. So I, my, well, I uh, already said what my conclusion would be. We need more about indicators, uh, more places, scale it up uh, and follow up. I want to, I would like to thank all of you, all the speakers, uh, the organizations, the interpreters for being here today. And it's, uh, and for, for your contributions. 
and it's a discussion to be continued. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much to all our panelists and the moderator for the session. Sin duda, esta sesión abre el debate a entender la magnitud de influencia de la This opens a debate to understand criminal gangs and criminal groups from a local and community perspective and their impact on social structures. Look into the interesting research projects presented in this panel. Thank you so much. I we want to thank the speakers and moderator as well. As in every session, my colleagues.